If this new Windows feature does not cause you to want to at least start experimenting a little bit with Linux, or even Mac at this point in time, I don't know what's going to get you <laughs> wondering what in the world's going on. So let's go ahead and talk about the new feature, as you probably have heard, but let's get a little bit of my take on it. Welcome back to Switched to Linux. If you like this type of content, please feel free to subscribe to the channel, give us a like or a dislike, share the video, and all that other fun and fancy stuff. Of course, here on Switch to Linux, we talk about switching to Linux, why you might want to. We talk about some privacy and business-related areas in this world, and hopefully give you a few tips that you might experiment with switching to Linux on your own, or at least, as we like to say, you know, you don't necessarily have to drop absolutely everything, but start doing more and more over there, figure out what it can do, and then maybe eventually you'll be in, uh, to the point where you go, enough is enough, Windows, enough is enough. You've, you've given me your ads after I've purchased the licenses, you've taken away my freedoms, you've encrypted my data, and uh, now you want to record everything I do. Yes, today we're going to be talking about the new feature called a Recall. And we want to talk a little bit about it. I have not watched any of the other videos out there. I know a ton of people have talked about it. So I did want to go ahead and give you some thoughts and some insight about it. So first, let's go ahead and talk about the new feature, the scope, what it is, where it is, and things like that. So first, this is not on every version of Windows. If you go out and buy a new version of Windows or you upgrade your current version of Windows, it's not implicitly going to start recording everything that you do. This is only applicable to certain computers. You're looking for the Copilot Plus PC, which has the Snapdragon X chips with the NPU as a neural processing chip, which is a chip embedded inside of new processors to help do AI functions. So what this feature is, is every three seconds it takes a record of your screen, a simple snapshot, not just of that, but it takes uh, it, it keeps track of everything that you're doing, your peripherals, your keystrokes, all this type of stuff. It basically records what's going on on your uh, on your uh, desktop. It's recording a lot of the key logging stuff, and then the the video component would be one every three seconds. And so it records and utilizes a lot of your, your storage data. This does require a lot of extra processing, so it has to be a computer with, I think, the 16 gigabytes is the minimum, and it does have to have a bare minimum of 256 gigabytes, a hard drive space of which 25 is going to default to storage three months of screenshots. So it's going to effectively record everything that you do on your computer nonstop for three months. Obviously, you can turn off components, you can pause it, you can tell it not to record certain applications. But outside of that, by default, when you turn on the computer, it starts recording. Again, not every single version of Windows has this. It has to have that Snapdragon X processor, although more processors will be added later, but it has to be a processor with an AI NPU chip. So that's what you're going to be looking for if you want to specifically get this nonsense or specifically avoid it. And so that is really what the feature is. It's just leaving a copy of everything that you're doing on your system. So you can ponder, eh, this is a little bit frightening. Now, it is not taking this data at this time and sending it up to the cloud. It's not taking this data and tying it specifically to your online Microsoft account. But is that out of the realm of possibility? Are we going to see things like this? Right now, there's no active monitoring or anything like that, although that is the type of stuff that we could see down the road. Now, let's go ahead and move on into the major problems. Actually, before we move into the major problems, my apologies, let's have a look at a couple articles about it uh, because I had some things I wanted to comment on. So from Ars Technica, new AI features will record everything you've done on your PC. So uh, basically on your active screen, uh, again, they, uh, this is application is called Recall. You can find the uh, you can find the icon for it on your on your panel. This is Copilot Plus PCs, and as soon as uh, you boot up and activate the computer, it is already active. It allows you to search and retrieve past activities on your computer up to a three months. Of course, you can increase or decrease the allocation. You can pause it for a period of time. It does say the snapshots are encrypted. Uh, we're going to comment a little bit more on that with the next article as uh, the, the author of the next article has forgotten a few 
things in Windows. We'll talk about those. Uh, but you can uh, users can access snapshots from specific time periods, providing context for the event or moment they're searching for. It allows searchers, you know, users to search through teleconference meetings they participated in. You can always record a teleconference meeting. Now we just have to assume if you're on a teleconference meeting, like this is a fun aspect of the law we have to think about. In many states are two-party consent states, which means you cannot record somebody. So if you have this application co-pilot running on a computer and you are on a teleconference call, if that person does not alert you the, about that, they actually could be held for felony charges of wiretapping. This raises some serious concerns because this is why if you get onto Zoom and things, if you have a presentation that's going to be recorded, everybody is aware it's going to be recorded. Well, if you're on a Windows computer with, with this uh, recall running and we're on a conference call and it's taking audio samples, text samples, recording samples, and I don't have any direct awareness of this, this is possibly a violation of the law. So that's a curious question for legal minds to ponder, which I am not a legal scholar. Uh, I'm just aware of what those rules happen to say. So it does say that everything remains local and private on device, and it even encrypts it to your home user's account. So if you have a computer with multiple users, the people can only see the rewind data related, uh, related to their specific account. And they go into some of the limitations. Now, over on Tech Radar, uh, they go in and talk about some of the issues we've already talked about. You know, one of them is it does take a tremendous amount of disk space. So if you do have a 256 gigabyte drive, then, uh, yeah, you're going to have 25 to 50 less of it. It's at 20, 256 gigabytes. It's 25. I think anything higher, it allocates 50 gigabytes. And, of course, you can change that. It does not record the... Uh, edge browser in private uh, in private mode, but it doesn't specify if any other browser in private mode is recorded. It does not record anything with DRM, so you can't use it to scrape DRM content. Uh, but other than that, it's going to record everything you're doing, including passwords, private data, all sorts of things that you may not want to have a record of on your system. Now, they did mention down here, um, Microsoft states recall snapshots are kept on Copilot Plus PCs themselves on the local hard disk are in, uh, protected using data encryption on your device. And if you have Windows, and he says parentheses, if you have Windows Pro or Enterprise, this is BitLocker from the wording. It looks like your snapshots are only encrypted if you have Windows Pro. Fake news! Um, this author has forgotten that prior to this rollout and the next rollout, I think actually that's the same rollout as this, home Users are also encrypted by default. If you have not watched our video on home encryption, uh, encryption on Microsoft, how Microsoft is doing it completely wrong. Encryption's good, except when you do it wrong. Microsoft is doing it wrong. So yes, home users will be encrypted as well because home uh, home versions of of uh, Windows 11 are encrypted as of the next version that is coming out. So we've talked about that. Uh, they talk, uh, and they, they have a whole paragraph about that, which this author forgets that home edition is cracked uh, as well. Um, but they also talk about the issues here with just because it's encrypted doesn't mean it's, it's secure. You know, uh, BitLocker has been cracked, cracked by quantum computing. Uh, presumably quantum computing doing a, a keyword stuff or something like that, a cred stuff attack or a, um, a dictionary attack, I guess was what you'd call that. And so your chance of that, being a serious impact right now is probably pretty low, uh, although down the road it probably would be. I would fear other things in, in favor. Uh, so it does say that um, they're only linked to the specific user account. We've already talked about that. They did mention that if you have a family PC and there's a single login, everybody's stuff is recorded. They call that as one of the, the downsides. If you're using a household computer, you don't have a password-protected profile, anyone could walk in, open up recall history. If you're doing anything unsavory, it's obvious. Um, this is called family accountability. I don't have a problem with this, okay? Um, you know, if you're out there doing uh, on, on unsavory parts of the Internet, maybe your family needs to find out so they can get you help. <laughs> OK, <laughs> that being said, there are legitimate other concerns with this. What if you're on a public computer? You go into a library, you turn it on and you're using the library to log into your bank. Believe it or not, it still happens. If that library computer is running recall, 
somebody's just recorded all your banking details and a bunch of other things that uh, you may not want them to know. The big concern I have uh, on the more legal end is work. Remember, there's been some work applications, uh, looking at some of these work applications that uh, they're trying to do massive key loggers, massive data analytics on employees. There have been research reports that show that employees are less productive when they're constantly being spied on. But you're now you're doing a work computer, and in the work computer, you have these constant snapshots. Well, now whoever administers that, they can in theory go in there and gain access to all this stuff. So this empowers a a workplace to spy on you to a much tighter degree than they probably need to. I mean, assuming you're a big boy and a big girl and you can do your work, you don't need to be spied on to this level. And then, of course, if your laptop gets hacked or a laptop gets stolen, these are legitimate concerns. So with that, let's move over into uh, my list of the huge problems. This is probably not exclusive, but first, it does not hide those printable details. So passwords are not specifically hidden as much as some of them are, you know, you, as you type passwords in. But remember, there's a key logging component as well, which is kind of frightening. Uh, anything displayed on the screen is completely visible. Uh, it takes massive amounts of data and processing. So if you want that 16 gigabyte computer because it's awesome speed, well, a lot of that's going to be taken up by the AI processor cataloging and logging everything you're doing. Uh, the next issue is it is on by default. This is a type of feature you should have to explicitly add. In fact, I remember when I was getting started in web design, we had sites like Elance uh, that uh, would have this uh, time clock. You'd install this thing and it would randomly take pictures of your desktop and it would record your hours. Now, it didn't do key logging and it wasn't every three seconds, but what it would do is you'd run the application, you'd start the clock, and when you had an Elance job that was hourly, you were guaranteed guaranteed pay as long as that was running and as long as the uh, the end client did not look through those screenshots and say, hey, why is he checking the sports when he should be building my website, right? And so that's the type of thing that uh, we had to explicitly start and explicitly stop. So it's okay in an application that needs it, but this is on by default and it's far more invasive than any of those tools were. It does store up to three months of data by default, the initial default three months of data. Now it is on the device, which means anybody who gains access to that device, back doors, whatever else, can gain access to that information. And there is a possibility down the road that they might silently tweak this and upload stuff to the cloud. I mean, it begs a question, what's going on with this Apple situation? Because there were people, uh, if you remember, if you upgraded to 17.5, pictures you deleted would suddenly come back. Well, this was happening on people who deleted photos five phones ago. So it's not like a local disk still had the file and the header wasn't overwritten yet. This is something else. Apple, I, in my opinion, based on the results we saw, I think that those files are still in Apple's cloud attached to your account. They're just with that cute little social media flag that says don't show to the end user. And that little tag got messed up. That's my theory. And it seems to fit the fact pattern we have because if it's just a matter of, yeah, if I go to this computer and I delete a video and I don't do much more on the computer, I can run an undelete program and I can recover uh, files. That's possible, very possible to do. But when we're talking about, I had an iPhone 5, I deleted a photo, and then iPhone 6, and then I had an iPhone 7, and then I had an iPhone 8, and now I have an iPhone 9, and then I update the iPhone 9 to 17.5, and the deleted photos from the iPhone 5 come back up? That's a problem. That means data was, in my opinion, stored in the cloud. And that's, I think, what can easily happen with this. Remember, Windows moved the codecs for WMA files into the cloud. you uh, I'm not sure if they fixed it or not, but at a point in time, you could not play a WMA file without connecting to the Internet because it would go to the Internet for the codec, therefore logging the file name that you're doing. There's some interesting thoughts that I have about this. Um, 
How will this be used on the work computers? We addressed that. And then, of course, a lost or stolen uh, computer is a risk. Of course, this is slightly mitigated with the fact that uh, your data is encrypted by default now. And, hey, if you don't know how to get into your password, then the hacker probably won't either. So hopefully he has access to a quantum computer. <laughs> so uh, let's move on to part number three. How do we avoid this, this tool? If you want to avoid it, the first thing you want to avoid, if, you, if you're like, I got to stay on Windows, I understand that that's fine you want to avoid a computer with the npu processor now right now that is a snapdragon x so the snapdragon x is the only model of computer that is shipping with this you want to look for something that is not labeled as copilot p uh, copilot plus pc that means that it is set up and configured to work the next thing you could do is see if you are tied into one of these, you disable it as soon as you get your computer. You turn that thing on before you do anything. Your first trip is into the settings to turn it off along with all of the other nonsense that you should be turning off when you first start a Windows computer. Of course, the very best thing you can do is you can switch to Linux. Linux is not some scary command line thing, okay? This desktop I'm working with is Linux. It is not scary. Look at this. I have a menu. I have a graphical user interface. I have a browser. I have desktop icons. I have file. I mean, I can do all sorts of neat stuff over here. Linux is not scary, folks. Now, I'm not saying you should dump your, your Windows 11 computer right the second. In fact, I am not an advocate of a cold turkey switch. Some people can do it. Some people have lack, luck with that, but I'm not a huge advocate for it. What I advocate for you to do is slowly switch to Linux. First, you want to take a list of all those applications you need to run. And you can need to figure out how can you get those that task running on an open source platform. Many of these tools you can install on your Windows computer and learn how to use them. And then you make the switch over to Linux. And then once you've done that, all that software you've gotten used to, it is now working just fine on your uh, on your Linux machine just like it did on your Windows so that is my my general tip I will highly encourage you to do that in fact coming up here we'll be talking about creating a new Linux on a test build I'm actually doing going to do it in production but it's a great way to test Linux by installing Linux onto an external USB hard drive we'll talk about that in a very soon upcoming window and uh, with that, subscribe to the channel if you have not already done so. Leave us some likes and some comments on this video. And uh, I will have a video here at the end about the first steps you might want to do in considering a switch to Linux. So go ahead and have a look at that video, and we will see you next time.